Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> hey, 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 don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila. Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click. Get flexible payment options. Then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to The Next Reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. Tree removal, man. <laughs> <laughs> Am I right? Yeah. yeah uh, what are we talking about tonight, Andy? Movies. Have you seen uh, Have you seen San Andreas yet? I haven't. Me neither. I was almost in it today, but uh, work intervened. Man, oh. I was close. That's too bad. I know. I know. Uh, but uh, I do want to talk about, uh, man, Blot comes out oh, of yeah. the woodwork in a big way. 
It was quite exciting. The good Ben Lott. I am so excited about this email that he sent us. Uh, ben Lott. You may remember Ben Lott from the Blot score of a while back, and then he went quiet. We didn't hear from him for some time. And it turns out, now I know the reason why. This email opens, well, it took me just over 14 months, but I've finally done it. I have now watched, rated, reviewed, and flick-charted every single movie you guys have covered on the next reel, with the exception of The Thin Man, which I'll be watching in a day or so because it was not available from Netflix. That's right, 185 movies I watched thanks to you guys. Check that out. That's awesome. I know. So this, uh, and and I should add, his, um, let's see, his flick chart username, for those who want to catch up with uh, Blot, Ben Lott, Blot 2013 on, and his letterboxed username is Blot. Now, we like Blot, Ben Lott. He has great taste in movies when he agrees with us. <laughs> and I, he, this email that he wrote us, I just read just a snippet because he goes on and on and on and compares category by category his uh, top flick chart rankings to ours in great detail. For example, top six movies you like much more than me. Top six movies I like much more than you. And, and it really points out uh, you know, where we have uh, fallen short. Uh, top six uh, or top four movies that we rank exactly the same. Who knew this was going to happen? Yeah, right. Adaptation hits both our charts at 87. Zodiac hits both our charts at 39. Misery, both our charts at 29. And The Bishop's Wife, both our charts at 154. What are the odds of that? I know, I know. somebody's going to calculate the odds of that. Somebody will. Probably, I would say, uh, four in 185. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, just you're, to, just you're, if I had to... You're a mathematical guess. genius. <laughs> uh, he also has the top five favorite movies that he watched for the first time thanks to us. This is the what I like to call the list of honor. Uh, Up in the Air, Jaws, The Fisher King, Compulsion, and Panic Room. I love that list. Uh, it's a great list. My bottom five least favorite movies that I would have happily never seen if it weren't for us. <laughs> this is also a good list the day of the locust <laughs> uh, i love that one I it's great it's a yet, wacky wacky movie I, <laughs> and yet, i get his point uh, i do too <laughs> strange days i think we would agree uh, i would yes level. i would uh yee yee I, I think we we probably part ways on that I, one i really enjoy that i'm one. with blot on that one uh knowing well that's I, a guilty pleasure what are you gonna do yeah i know it is <laughs> And Labor Day, I don't know how you could shun a, a James Vanderbeek vehicle like that, but <laughs> but he managed well, maybe, to do it. <laughs> maybe by next year he'll have two more of our guilty pleasures to add onto that list. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. This was uh, this was a really enormously gratifying. I mean, it's it, I think it's the single best bit of feedback I think we've ever gotten on the show. Oh, absolutely. It was fun to read. It was fascinating to read. Lots of interesting statistical bits about uh, favorites and, yeah. and least favorites and all that. And it was just, it was fun. It's, you know, it's fun to see somebody kind of, uh, you know, play it along, so to speak. Oh, I loved it. It was it was really uh, an honor to read that. And he has actually agreed. Uh, ben has agreed to uh, let us guest post that on our blog. So his, uh, the, if you're interested in the blot score, hopefully we're going to be hearing even more from Ben now that he's caught up. Uh, because he's, his opinion is one that we value. So, um, Absolutely. Yes, yeah, so that'll be on the blog uh, when the show goes live. If you're listening to the show right now, you could jump over to the blog. You could read uh, Ben's full uh, post, which is uh, perfectly great. And then, you know, he, he now that you can tell he caught up because he started, he started commenting on our movies again. Right, you're right, yes. And he already gave us a little bit of a spanking. What did, you tell, what did he say about... Uh, <laughs> uh, for our Mad Max. About Fury Road. Uh, did yeah, you feel I, the shame? <laughs> I, I did. I felt the shame a little bit afterward. The fact that it jumped so high on our uh, flick chart ranking. And yes, uh, he, he may be right that uh, perhaps it was a little bit too fresh in our minds being a new release and everything that we got a little excited, a little carried away. <laughs> that might have happened. I, uh, <laughs> I think it just may have. Um, but He called it a silly chase movie, Andy. <laughs> yeah, well, right. And for that, we're, I, maybe we should just leave it where it is. <laughs> 
Uh, so yes, this was the comment on uh, on uh, Mad Max Fury Road, which you know still is high on my list. It ended up landing at number five in our flick chart uh, ranking. But I have to admit, this is part of the uh, shame of flick chart. When it works, it works really well. But in this case, it didn't come up against some movies that we would obviously have ranked it beneath. Right. right. I mean, there, there are some movies in there that I would that it, it just ended up getting shuffled up as number five because of the movies that it hit. I think. Yeah, I think so. So I think so. Um, that's a good excuse. I'll stick with it. That. That's what I. That's the one I've been <laughs> hanging my hat on this week. So. Uh, in any case, uh, big, big, huge, big thanks to to Ben for for playing along and being a part of the community. We sure appreciate it. Uh, any? Do Absolutely. we have any other news? I don't think that. Uh, I don't think we have any other news. I don't think we do. Let's tell the people where we're from. Where are we from? Is the next reel, everybody? I'm Pete Wright, and that there is Andy Nelson. Hello! And we spoil movies. Tonight on the show, the second in our series on the black and white work of cinematographer James Wong Howe with Sam Wood's 1942 film King's Row. But uh, before we get into that, you should learn more about us at thenextreel.com. Subscribe for free on iTunes or follow us on Twitter and Facebook at The Next Reel. And if you're the kind of person who pulls wings off of flies and legs off of spiders, then you're also the kind of person who should head over to Instagram.com slash TheNextReel and play the next reel's Instagram, hashtag PonyPrize, hashtag Guess the Movie Challenge. Andy, how did we do against these diabolical doctors this week? This was a fun week because uh, it threw people a little bit, particularly uh, JoJo Lee 23 who was was awfully specific in her guess. Um, uh, on image three, she guessed that it was the time machine with Rod Taylor being very specific as to which one. And unfortunately, she was wrong because it was actually the time machine with Guy Pierce. And if she <laughs> it had only said the, the time machine, then we probably would have given it to her. But because of her specificity, she missed it until image five when she finally was able to figure out, oh, it's the time machine with Guy Pierce. <laughs> Uh, so luckily, her guess on day three did not clue anyone else in, and it threw everybody uh, and gave her two more days to figure it out. And yes, day five, Joe Jolie 23 figured out that it was the time machine with Guy Pierce. Terrible, terrible film, but uh, it was uh, it did provide for a fun week of Instagram guessing. And Joe Jolie 23 is once again entered to win our 2015 Pony Prize. That, that was like the best rebound shot. <laughs> ever <laughs> was <laughs> that was the best that was the best that was uh and and in our back channel i love the back channel between you and steven smart <laughs> running this contest in the back channel saying oh should we give it to her oh let's see if she gets it <laughs> this is great i am uh i'm really glad that she came back around and got that one and got entered again congratulations absolutely absolutely so yep uh with that andy Let's do trailers. I'm saying, this may not be the sequel to the Bourne films that we wanted, but it's the sequel to the Bourne films that we deserved, Andrew. Kristen Stewart, <laughs> Jesse Eisenberg, Connie Britton, Topher Grace, Bill Pullman, John Leguizamo, Walton Goggins, these people have come together under the pen of Max Landis, the pen behind one of our faves, Chronicle, and oh, director yeah. uh, Nima Norizade, mm -hmm. the man behind Project X, crazy found footage party film from uh, 2012. Do you ever see that one? I didn't. I missed that one. Bananas. Was it? Yeah, it was great. I, I had a great time watching it. It was one of those sort of aspirational films. Anyway, that's, that's neither here nor there. Uh, these people came together, and they bring us the story of a stoner who is actually a well-trained government agent, <laughs> and he doesn't know it. I love the comedy of this trailer. I love the tone of this trailer. I love the cast of this trailer. I love the wonderful stoner underdog takes on the man vibe of this trailer. You can absolutely count me in when this opens late this summer, August 21st. Hey, I just killed two people. <laughs> That's awesome. They had guns and knives and they were being like total dicks. Did you call the cops? No, I didn't call the police because I have like a lot of weed and like mushrooms in my car. <gasps> How did this happen? I don't know, but I'm like freaking out all over the place, babe. I have a lot of anxiety about this. What'd you think of Jesse Eisenberg's uh, stoner action hero? 
I thought he was perfect. Uh, he was brilliantly cast in the role. I mean, this, you know, I was not a fan of Pineapple Express, but this looks like everything that I wanted Pineapple Express to be. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad you said that. I couldn't remember what what movie I was thinking about that this that I that yeah, that's the one. Yeah, it's a, that one just kind of devolved into just some dumb humor. This one looks to be more focused on the action, and it just happens to take place in the world of a stoner <laughs> who is this <laughs> super spy and has no clue. And I love the concept. I love uh, just both him and Kristen Stewart. This may be like a perfect casting for, for Kristen Stewart also. She, there's something about her. She always just looks stoned anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> That is so true. That is really true. I think it's going to be uh, pretty brilliant. So I can't wait to see this one. I am very excited about it. So once again, late summer, August 21st. Uh, and, and now I feel like I've had a preview. I've been the preview to your preview. It looks uh, it looks like one that you really want to see on an IMAX screen or the biggest thing that you possibly can. This is Everest, the adventure drama thriller coming out in September that uh, is about the climbing ex- expedition on Mount Everest where uh, the big snowstorm came in and there were two parties up there um, trying to get to the top and all of a sudden the storm rolled in and all these people are trying to figure out what to do. Um, the cast of this, uh, like every single person in it, every time they cut to another face, I was very excited. It just, it didn't stop. Jake Gyllenhaal, Kira Knightley, Robin Wright, Josh Brolin, Jason Clark, Sam Worthington, Emily Watson, John Hawks, one of my favorites. It's just tons of great people in this in this thriller about these people trapped on Mount Everest and trying to survive. It looks gripping. It looks frightening. Um, the cinematography just looks stunning and beautiful, but at times uh, just not <laughs> like the, the worst place to be in the world. And it looks like, uh, it does look like an IMAX film, but it's actually a narrative film. And so it, it just really, uh, the production value of it is very high. It's directed by uh, Baltazar uh, Kormakur. I'm not quite sure if I'm saying that right. He is uh, Icelandic from Reykjavik. And uh, he's the guy who is behind Two Guns and Contraband. I didn't see either of those films. Neither of them uh, spoke to me when I saw the trailers. Uh, did you see either of those, Pete? Uh, no. No, no. So I can't speak to uh, Baltazar's work, but this one looks pretty stunning. Uh, written by uh, uh, the screenplays by William Nicholson and Justin Isbell with a story by Simon Beaufoy, Lem Dobbs, and Mark Madoff. I know there's a lot of mountaineering experience in this room. You wouldn't be here without it. But Everest is the most dangerous place on Earth. Human beings simply aren't built to function at the cruising altitude of a 747. Our bodies will be literally dying. So the game is, can we get you up to the top, down to the bottom, before that happens? I was blown away. I Did you read the book, Into Thin Air? This was based on the Krakauer book, Into Thin Air. Uh, I didn't read the book. That's one of those books that I never got around to. Totally on on my list, um, and now even more so. I think this was also the story um, that you know for the nerds. I think this was the one that where the New York Times did that beautiful, beautiful um, uh, storytelling piece with the like integrated media and pictures and slideshows and things all in this long scrolling article. It was just gorgeous. Uh, I think this is the same one. So this story has been told a number of times, and yet this film, um, it, it it just, as you said it, I mean, it looks like an IMAX film that just begs to be seen on the biggest of the biggest of the biggest screens. It Absolutely. Was, it was stunning. It's a stunning trailer. Yeah. It, it, everything about it is just, I mean, it looks like they were filming an IMAX documentary is right. what it looks like, but it happens to be this story about the, uh, yeah, the... Uh, uh, the Mount Everest disaster back in uh, when was that? Ninety six. Ninety six. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the nineteen ninety six season expedition recorded eight deaths, the third most deaths on a single day. Um, the two thousand fifteen Nepal earthquake caused the most eighteen deaths, uh, mm. and unfortunately, Crack Hour's guides Rob Hall and Andy Harris both died. So the, you know, we kind of know. You read the Wikipedia page, you know that this uh, 
you know, kind of know how it ends. Um, but it's, boy, does it look great. Just beautiful film work. This is one of the films that is on the real 3D list. Yes. It's shot with 3D cameras. So I am um, fascinated by how they make this movie. I, I can't, that, I'm almost looking forward to that more than I'm looking forward to the movie. That's not in, true, of course. That's complete hyper, <laughs> hyperbole. Uh, but I'm going to let it out, stand out there. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. It, it's one that's be very interesting to see the behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah. Like, were they just walking on little green screen planks, and the whole everything was created around them? Were they filming? I like, I just don't know enough about about uh, what they were actually doing to get this movie made. The whole thing filmed on location in on Mount Everest. <laughs> on Mount Everest. <laughs> Yikes! Um, yeah. So, when did you say it opens? September eighteenth. I will be there. Me too. Why, Andy? Yes. I don't, I don't know how a girl as pretty as you can be so practical. Did you read King's Row? I never read such a fascinating story. When a boy who belongs uptown starts taking a girl from the lower end of town out buggy riding at night, people talk. I married you. That had shut their traps. I wouldn't marry you, Drake. We were going to run away. She'd been getting out to meet me for a long time. Do I need to say anything more? Did Dr. Tower know anything about this? I guess I wouldn't be here today if he had. Don't, even now, don't say anything you don't mean. I don't even know how I feel about you. Dr. Tarr, I'm going to ask you a question perhaps you won't like answering. Is Dr. Gordon a good doctor? Not a very tactful question, young man. Not a very ethical one for a young doctor to be to ask. Ever since I can remember, I've noticed things. Drake finds out. You'll never find out. Yes, he will. She'll come again or someone else will. That kind of news always gets home. That would. King's Row, Andrew, 1942. Uh, film directed by Sam Wood, written by Casey Robinson, based on the book by Henry Bellaman. Uh, the film stars the uh, lovely Ann Sheridan, Robert Cummings, and uh, former President of the United States, Ronald Reagan, along with Betty Field, Charles Coburn, Claude Rains. Dave Anderson, Nancy Coleman, Karen Byrne. Uh, it, it's got a oh uh, Harry Davenport is Colonel Skeffington. Uh, it's a it's a fantastic cast in a film about uh, it's about a lot of bananas dark stuff that I had a really hard time rationalizing in my head as a movie from 1942. <laughs> right? Yes. Now yes. neither of us had seen this movie, so this is a single viewing conversation right did you happen to watch it twice i didn't i didn't I, have time i did not either so this is a one-time view for both of us so really it's a it's it's a first impressions kind of a conversation it is but you're right for 1942 i mean the notes that i took go from what a dark story to ah oh, what sweet simplicity <laughs> <laughs> yes it's bananas my final note <laughs> was uh king's row a triumph for the mental health profession <laughs> <laughs> like where does that come from this was just a bananas movie i was i was slacking you throughout the movie just telling you how bananas i thought this movie was it is all over the place the book apparently is even more uh bananas for being written in the period it is uh dark it is about sex and incest and and just and and other uh weird things that go on in small towns well and big towns and big towns <laughs> things that go on in towns Full of people. <laughs> Things that go on anywhere there's people. <laughs> but nobody uh, likes to talk about it. <laughs> can you, do you think it is possible uh, to give just a brief uh, summary of what you recall as the film being about? Well, sure, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is a film that takes place uh, right at the turn of the century, the previous century. It starts in 1890, and I believe it goes through about... 1905 or so? I thought it was late 18, not very late 18, 18, very late teen, 1800s. No, 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 it passes because remember, he writes Century on the, uh, you know, Happy New Year, Happy yeah. Century. Oh, you're Happy talking about century. when it ends. Yeah, I wasn't paying attention to you. Just right. start, it starts in, in 1890. And yeah, right, yeah, you're it right. It runs That's right. into, I think, 1905 or so. Yes, yeah. Um, although it could be longer, but. Um, violent agreement. It is basically about a group of people. Uh, who grow up in this small town where there happen to be uh, a lot of dark 
things happening, dark secrets, dark stories, and we follow several of them as they kind of grow and change and uh, see how this town changes through time. Paris is our one of our main characters who grows up to become a doctor focusing on psychiatry mm-hmm. or psychology. One of the very first. Yeah. And then his good friend Drake is kind of the uh, the young, uh, I don't know if I'd call him a scoundrel, but he certainly um, loves the ladies. And, uh, and he kind of grows up under the shadow of rich relatives and, uh, and then loses all of his money and life uh, takes a very dark turn for him. Then you have Cassie, a young girl who grows up with her father uh, taken out of school and uh, she's friends with Paris, but uh, he doesn't know why she's taken out of school. As they, as he gets older and and re befriends her, he learns about her. Well, I don't know if he really learns about her dark secrets, but she definitely has darkness in her life, and uh, her story gets incredibly dark. <laughs> yeah, she's she's got some issues as as she's killed by her father, who then kills himself. <laughs> And then, uh, then there's Randy. 1942. <laughs> and then there's Randy, who uh, is the girl who lives on the, uh, the the other side of the tracks. A little bit more of a tomboy, yet she and Drake, who lives on the money side of the tracks, uh, they kind of end up connecting later in the story. And uh, and yeah, it's it's there. It's the story primarily, I guess, of those people as they grow and change and they see the world changing around them in this town of darkness. <laughs> <laughs> this was uh, supposedly modeled after um, uh, Ballaman's uh, hometown of Fulton, Mississippi. Uh, so many apologies, uh, Fulton listeners, uh, for what I hope you are not living with today. Apparently, uh, yeah, the townspeople realized after the book came out, it didn't take too long before they started realizing, <laughs> wait a minute, this I sounds a little guy. too familiar. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think, uh, I don't think that Bellamin was, uh, was <laughs> liked too much after all of that. Wow. Sorry, I had to yawn. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'll cut that out. Um, so... On your first viewing, did you like this film? I actually did like this film. This was a film that I watched it, and I think I, you know, in my head, I kind of gave it like three stars. And then the more I kept thinking about it, it it like kind of stuck in my craw a little bit. And it's just, I kept thinking about it and going back to it. And I ended up bumping it up a little bit. So it's probably like three and a half stars now. Um, I liked it. I found it really interesting. I really liked the characters. I like. I really connected with these characters as uh, as a little bit, um, particularly Paris, as a little bit um, uh, kind of schmaltzy. Uh, he can be sometimes a little bit over uh, passionate, over excited about things. Uh, you know, he he kind of come across that way. But somehow it kind of all fit. I just really liked the characters. I liked this world and. I think it was this the dark element of it that really kind of drew me in. It was something that I hadn't seen before from, at least I don't think I have, from a film from the 40s. It really just kind of stuck with me. And then when I started learning more about the book, it made me really wish for somebody to to pick it up and, and adapt it again for modern audience so they, they could put in all of the different things about like there's... There's a, a story plot line dealing with homosexuality. There's a story plot line dealing with, um, I think he actually ends up euthanizing his grandmother. I think it's a mercy killing. Yeah. Um, there's the, uh, uh, you learn more specifically in the book about how Cassie's father is actually, uh, has, you know, is, there's incest going on in that relationship. She's right. not just schizophrenic, but her father, you know, is also molesting her. And, then there's also the the fact that Cassie, it went, once she kind of connects with Paris, that he gets her pregnant. And that's one of the reasons she wants to run away and then doesn't. And then her father kills her. And, and then there's also just all the apparently nymphomania dealing with Drake and the fact that he's just sleeping with pretty much all the women in town. Now, one of the things that came out uh, in this film, this was a very difficult film to, to make uh, at the time because of... 
uh, as we've we've talked uh, so much before, of the Hayes Code. And uh, in this case, taking a book like this with all of these references to homosexuality and euthanasia and incest and nymphomania and, I, I mean, it just uh, uh, crazy uh, stuff to be talking about on in the mainstream on the big screen in 1942, it's just bananas that the producer, uh, Hal Wallace, uh, would have bought this, would have, have acquired this property and said, I think we can make this into a movie. Just crazy to do this. I don't think they did a terribly good job excising all of these inferences, all of these uh, uh, elements of the film. I came away from the film really seeing just how well this darkness is implied in, in the film. Do you feel like it was sufficiently sterilized without no, having researched well- it? No, I, I, this is what I, uh, there's an interesting benefit to the Hayes Code that I find in some of these films when you watch them now with modern eyes, that looking at the film, it ends up creating so much more subtext. Yes. And it makes it, in a way, much more interesting to watch because they can't actually say a lot of this stuff. And it's all just inferred and it's in looks and it's in these moments. And... Uh, and I end up really liking that in some of these films that uh, really were hiding stuff, uh, covering it up right. because it's, of the Hayes It's code. the Jaws effect, right? I mean, it's scarier yeah. because you don't see it. Absolutely. Right? And this film, I think, is a testament to that. It is a darker film because all of these horrible moral issues, these dis- the, the complexities of these moral issues that the film attempts to take on, that the text took on directly— they all have to be uh, inferred by the audience. And I think that is, uh, I I think that's a, it it ends up making a more interesting film, even, you know, whether it's enjoyable to you or not, uh, it is a much more interesting film. And I think it makes the, the, the performances that much more complex. I I don't know what I expected from the performances, but I didn't expect that. I I know I was pleased with the depth of, of some of the more challenging performances, particularly Cassandra, uh, and uh, and and I, you know, Ron Reagan, who in the beginning of the film is comes off as as something of a lightweight, but it ends up turning in quite a, a performance. As he says, it's the you know it's a film that made him a star. Well, and everybody, you know, from everything that I've read, everybody says this is his best performance that he ever gave. And right. I I've only seen a handful of his films, but I thought he was fantastic in this film. I completely agree. Cassie was great. Uh, he was great. And uh, was it Louise, uh, the other girl that uh, that Drake liked, whose parents? Yeah, it was Louise, whose parents hated him yeah. because he was such a philanderer. Um, she also, uh, Nancy Coleman, gave a really interesting performance of Louise as she was dealing with the conflict of wanting to be with this guy but having to succumb to. Uh, the decisions of her parents, uh, i.e., you are not allowed to be with that boy because he is a bad influence. And there were some just painful scenes, like when her her father, uh, Dr. Gordon, tells her, you are not allowed to ever see him, and she's going to defy him. And he says, if you do, I will have you committed before you get to see right. that boy. It's like, wow. And then just and then dealing with her as she's kind of like almost driven insane by these parents. Of yes, yes. You know, there's this other layer on top of it, and I think this it, it makes this film more interesting to me, which is the, you know, just because of the time in which it is set, there are these little hints, uh, you know, the, the one line that I wrote down, and I... Um, I can't remember the words exactly. It, it's the... it's I think it's Colonel um, Skeffington, mm-hmm. uh, who is talking about how great it is that uh, when Drake leaves... Uh, he says, gosh, I, I really like that because he's the one who who always says, sir, to his elders. Yeah. Right? There is this sense of th- that this film is really trying to put, shine a light on this idea of the way uh, the way things were, right? The grace and the politeness and the civility and the culture uh, that we once celebrated. And now over the course of a couple of months in this film, we see everything through the through the lens of these elders, we see everything falling apart in their view uh, culturally, and I think that ends up being a, a a really interesting thing to watch. Even if you know, I think where the film where I have trouble with the film is that all all of these you know couples and and couplings are kind of hard to keep track of. 
right? Particularly Drake. Who are the women in this film that he's that are in orbit of his character that we need to keep track of? Uh, I I think it was just uh, Louise and Randy. Yeah, I know. But then it starts with uh, it starts with Poppy. You know, or we we're supposed well, to keep up with her and the thing. I mean, I know it's just it's it's here it is. We're going to show you know what his life is like. But I'm not sure how much I'm supposed to pay attention to him in the beginning. Uh, I you know the the families the two doctors uh, I, I end up getting you know, found myself getting confused between who's that now which one is the is the uh, is the one that's killing people and which is the one that's the <laughs> that's the the one with the incest like I you know it was it was kind of hard to keep track of it so I found that kind of confusing it bounced it, it felt like it bounced around a lot and and I'm sure that that would resolve on another viewing I, I'm sure I would figure that out. Um, yeah, yeah, you might. I, I mean, I didn't really have too much of a problem connecting some of the that stuff. Um, so it, you know, I, I think that that's stuff that would definitely clear up on multiple. Yeah, things. but but none, even through all of that, none of it really mattered to me because what I when the film ended in the credits roll, I found myself saying that is a love letter to an era that they will never have again, and it's something that. I, I feel like I can't relate to, you know, the Victorian era, saying goodbye to the Victorian era. Uh, but I can absolutely see how um, this would be something that uh, that they would really celebrate in the period in which it was made. Um, and it, it feels a little bit like me watching, you know, The Breakfast Club. Well, it's uh, interesting that this, I believe, came out the same year as the Magnificent Ambersons, Orson Welles' mm-hmm. uh, follow-up to Citizen Kane, because it's exactly the same uh, topic. It's dealing with the progression of time and how things change and how it affects this uh, the Ambersons, the family. And so in this case, it was more just how it affected this group of people in this, and really this town. But um, yeah, it was interesting kind of thinking of those two films happening right at the same time here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what do we know of Sam Wood, the director? Um, Sam Wood, uh, you know, I don't know a whole lot about him, but I believe, didn't he direct shortly before this? I don't know how much uh, longer uh, or how much before this. Um, he had directed an adaptation of Our Town. Yeah, just a couple was, of years, 1940. Yeah, which was another a film that was very much kind of about a town and people in it, although nowhere near as dark. So it's kind of interesting that, uh, that he is, uh, the man behind two of those films. Right. Uh, I, have you seen any, uh, much other stuff from Sam Wood? Um, I have seen, uh, I know I've seen a few things of his, he has a strange uh, uncredited, uh, role as, um, uh, director of gone with the wind yeah i don't know i don't don't know the the you know story behind behind that we obviously haven't been researching gone with the wind but it's uh, it just popped up as i was researching earlier today Uh, i thought that was interesting it's funny because i didn't know much about sam wood and yet i find i've seen more films than i'm than uh than i thought I don't think I've seen, uh, I mean, looking through, I mean, it's, it's pretty, I mean, he's got 82 director credits, pretty, pretty lengthy. I mean, he started back in the, in 1920, in the silent days. And I don't think that I've really seen much of his, if anything of his, I did see some of Queen Kelly. I think he came, well, I saw Queen Kelly. So I saw some of his uncredited directing that he did uh, when he came in to fill in for um, uh, Eric von Stroheim, who I believe was uh uh, that was taken out of his hands, and other than that, I I want to say it was just the uh, the Marx Brothers movies that are really the only ones that I've probably seen of his. I uh, I I actually right in a row in in the late thirties and forties, Goodbye, Mister Chips, uh, Gone with Wind, obviously Our Town, uh, Devil and Miss Jones, and then uh, King's Row now and Pride of the Yankees right after that. So right in a row, Devil and Miss Jones, King's Row, and and Pride of the Yankees, uh, and. That surprised me because I you could have given me those movies and I would not have been able to tell you that Sam Wood directed it. Directed yeah, it. Yeah, sure. Um, but I found myself really enjoying this film, and as you said, uh, you know the complexities of the story aside, um, it was it it moved right along at two hours and I think seven minutes. It didn't it didn't feel that long to me. It felt like a story that uh, that moved right along. It also felt like a story that was in that that was there was a really natural intermission. Uh, right in the middle, it sort of changed tone, and I was able to get up and do the dishes and not feel like uh, I was jumping <laughs> out of the out of the uh, scene. It's sort of uh, uh, it, it was a nice split. 
Yeah, it did kind of uh, it did kind of work right at the uh, little time transition there yeah. in the middle. Yeah, yeah, around Vienna when, uh, mm-hmm. when uh, yes, when he goes Paris, Paris goes to Vienna uh, to learn to be a doctor. Yes. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's talk about some some people, shall we? Yeah, let's. You want to start with Paris? Let's start with Paris. How, Good how old. Do you do, how do you do uh, for you, Robert Cummings? I was you know he was very chipper. <laughs> Yes, he was. He was a very uh, just effervescent guy, and initially, I was like, "Okay, he might be a little over the top." But as I continued watching him, it really ended up kind of fitting for the role because his role was one of almost like the most innocent in the story. You know, he the way that he approached everything, and not innocent like naive, but just innocent as if. Uh, he might have been because like you were saying earlier he's the guy that Skeffington comments he always uh, says sir his grandmother has trained him in classical piano he almost feels like somebody who is almost born of their era rather than of this current era and so he just has this presence about him i i think you're right and i think he he plays actually an interesting contrast to Ronald Reagan's character uh, of Drake, who is the, you know, he's kind of the money man, he's the the womanizer, and he is also the man of that era, right? I mean, what he, all he's thinking about, you know, in contrast to Paris, who's thinking about, you know, medicine and taking care of the town and the things that we can do to, to you know, heal a town through the power of medicine. Uh, we have Drake, who's thinking about, how can I get this housing development, on, <laughs> you know, get investors right. for this housing development, which is, which is, you know, taking that small town and and churning up the soil and creating something new and bigger out of it, something which is really, you know, resonates against those who are uh, of of the prior era. And so I think there, the contrast is really interesting. And I would say um, the, the the sequence that stands out to me the the most is at the very, uh, you know, when uh, they have their moment, uh, the the two uh, Drake and Paris have their moment and he comes back after Paris comes back from Vienna and rushes into the room to see Drake in bed. Uh, and we should talk about how Drake ends up in bed. Uh, and they grab each other and they have this longing look in each other's eyes. And then they, they hold each other cheek to cheek Mm -hmm. in a really awkward and uncomfortable way, (laughs) like physically awkward, like no two people would ever do that. But it's made it, it, even more awkward by the intensity that you. I mean, that's the that was that homosexual undertone that those these guys were meant to be together, uh, and all the other relationships are are just sort of in orbit of that. Although in the book, there's another guy who's the one who's who is basically fallen in love with uh, with Paris. Oh, where was this a, a Viennese it, guy? Was this in Vienna or no? Was this in they the small they town? totally yeah, it's in the small town. They totally cut him out completely. Hmm. Of the movie, but yeah. it, isn't it interesting? Then I didn't know that. Isn't it interesting then that we still end up with this, with this, you know, like the implication of a relationship uh, yeah. between these two guys? I mean, that longing between Reagan and and Cummings, I thought was, I mean, it was palpable. Yeah, it was very interesting uh, the way that that it read, mm-hmm. um, and it's one of those things where it's like, is it coming across as uh, and an, that? innocence of the era or what were there those undertones there and it did feel like they're they were playing with some of those undertones and it made me wonder having learned about this other thread in the book that was cut out if wood uh and uh and the uh, and the writer of the script um what was his name again casey robinson put that in to just kind of give a nod to that element from the book that's absolutely how i read it that is absolutely how i read it of course you know obviously perception of the time but Sure. Um, and, and I can say, I, you know, I, I think I wanted them <laughs> ultimately to end up together, you know? <laughs> like, yeah, anyway. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'm a, I agree with you around Paris. I thought Robert Cummings did a great job. Man, that guy was crazy famous in a way that I can't, you know, I don't, I, I don't recognize looking at this movie from 1942. But, but near the 70s, 80s, uh, you know, he had a weekly show for you know, 156 episodes of his own show, The Bob Cummings Hour. Uh, he was on all kinds of TV all the way up into the, the um, you know, wild world of Disney color. 
uh, Disney's Wonderful World of Color in 1986. Yeah, he, uh, yeah the awesome. 15th anniversary celebration of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, he was uh, all over the place for a lot of years, and uh, this was him yeah. uh, a bit younger. He's, but He was in a couple uh, Hitchcock movies, Saboteur and Dial M for Murder right. also. Right. Uh, so there's Robert Cummings. Let's, move, let's talk about uh, Ronald Reagan since we were kind of on there, on the Drake yeah. thing. Yeah. I really enjoy him. I mean, I do think this was a, a great performance of him. Um, it's a, It was a very interesting... Th- I like I, Neither of us knew anything going into this movie, so everything that happened in it completely took me by surprise. And the part where he, uh, yeah, he loses all of his money because the banker absconds with all of his, uh, his trust fund, basically, along with a bunch of other people's. And... And then he's working at uh, Randy's father's train yard, working in the train yard, and uh, a pile of something falls on him, and and he gets run over by a train. Although it and he his legs get amputated is what happens, and that is the uh, you know there's that brilliant line when he wakes up and he looks down at his uh, lower extremities and he screams, "Where's the rest of me?" <laughs> and it was such a such a line for Reagan that he ended up using that as the title of his autobiography that he wrote in the '60s, which is a, I guess that was a a big line for him, and uh, and he was so nervous about delivering that line well and not coming across like a fool that he talked to uh, people who had lost appendages about what did it feel like. He had been rehearsing and rehearsing, and the night before he had to do it, he didn't sleep at all, and. Uh, and so he was completely exhausted and Sam Wood had him do it. And, and it, it sounds like he just ended up hitting it right out of the gate. And, uh, it was just one of those things cause he was so tired and Sam Wood kind of surprised him by, by doing it right now. And, and, uh, yeah, it sounded like he turned out, uh, uh the performance for the film is, uh, is pretty good. I thought, right. The first take, the first and yeah. only take of that scene, it was, it was very powerful. It's a weird line. It's like a, like, I can't read that line on my screen without kind of laughing a little bit. And yet I thought Reagan, uh, I thought he, he did a good job. He delivered it. Yeah, I absolutely thought he delivered. I thought he did a great job with that line. It's one of those lines that if it's read wrong, it's going to be terrible. Yeah. <laughs> it really could have uh, just made a mess of the film, but I do think that he did a good job with it. So, yeah, yeah I do too. Um, you know, I thought their relationship was good. I thought I liked his relationship with Randy a lot. In particular, the way uh, I thought he did a fantastic job uh, kind of turning the corner on his loss. You know, when he finally goes to Randy's uh, father and brother and says, I need to talk to you. I need a job. Um, you know, I thought that was a really nice sequence and uh, and a believable sequence for the time that, you know, didn't didn't strike me as, as odd at all. And I thought their re- response is the kind... Uh, sort of the kind Irish guys, um, you know, I I really, I was warmed by that after, you know, learning about a lot of darkness in this film. I completely agree. Uh, very, very then strong. It, then it got weird uh, when after he loses his legs and the, there's a sequence where all three of uh, the, uh, Randy and her brother and her father are at the bottom, right before the, where's the rest of me as, as Drake is about to wake up or Drake mm-hmm. has, has gotten up and, She's about to go upstairs, and she says, well, you know, he has no money. And the brother says, well, he, he doesn't need any money, does he? You know, the, saying, hey, we're going we're gonna to take care of him. We're going to let this guy live here. Uh, and I thought that was so awkward. It was like the <laughs> weirdest exchange in the film, in a film full of some kind of weird exchanges. <laughs> That's funny. I guess I don't remember that one. It didn't strike me as oh uh, odd, I guess. It was but. like the weirdest like Disney thing. Oh, well, of course, we'll let the amputee live in our upstairs room <laughs> like some sort of a haunted old bat. <laughs> it was just so strange. I couldn't get it out of my head. Oh, that's uh, funny. I, I can only hope that some people will be as kind to me when... I am when you get when the, you're amputated when I'm amputated yeah. the the um the the story of the amputation though it takes us into the story of this sociopathic doctor right right that's what you get for fooling around <laughs> with the wrong girl <laughs> holy cow <laughs> now this was doctor uh which doctor was this this was Dr Gordon Dr Gordon 
Yeah, and and he was uh, he he liked Louise and wanted to run away with her, but her parents would have none of it. And uh, Doctor Gordon, who we see at the very beginning of the film treating a patient, and without uh, without anesthesia or without chloroform, I believe. Wasn't this is what they like were using. Paris's father or something? Like when he was a kid? No, there, who was it? Was it, it was it was a it, just another kid, oh, just okay. a friend that they knew, and the friend was outside crying <laughs> because Doctor Gordon was in operating on his dad and said that you know his, his whatever was wrong with him. Um, They're taking him into point, surgery. Right. It was at a point where they couldn't use chloroform. And so he had to do it with no anesthesia. And so you just hear his dad screaming from the uh, upstairs bedroom. And uh, it turns out, as we learned, that Dr. Gordon is a bit of a, a psychopath who who likes to play God, basically, and judge you. And if he judges that you are a bad person then he will perform surgery on you, uh, unnecessary surgeries possibly, and he will not use anesthesia. And so because of his absolute hatred for Drake, he ab- uh, he uh, amputates his both of his legs for no reason. Even though we find out that, yes, he turns out his legs are not broken and, uh, uh, you know, he just wanted to, wanted to do the deed. Uh, and then he kills himself and poisons his daughter, killing her too. No, that's the other. That's oh, the that's other one. Tower. That's Tower. That's Tower. Claude Rains. Okay. Yeah, you're getting the See, this is the confused. thing. I get the doctors confused, and then it's yeah. all then it's all falls apart. No, Doctor Gordon just he ends up dying. Yeah. Of old age, and right, his right, right. his wife, uh, uh, Judith Anderson, playing Mrs. Gordon, a wonderful Judith Anderson, um, who's very memorable from uh, uh, what was that uh, other wonderful Hitchcock film, Rebecca, that she was in, mm-hmm. and. Um, uh, right, so then uh, Mrs. Gordon uh, is the one who's now trying to keep Louise at bay and, and, and brings Paris back into the picture and everything. But yeah, Dr. Gordon died uh, at some point while Paris was away at school. So it is Louise who is, is the inciting incident uh, to, to bring out the truth of the amputation. Uh, right. As as she goes over to Drake as he's convalescing in the in the uh, in Randy's house and starts screaming about it. And and then we get the transformation from Paris, realizing that he's, you know, as he's he found out that, in fact, this is uh, this is Dr. Doom and didn't tell Drake. He thought he was protecting Drake as a psychiatrist, that it was his duty not to tell the truth to his patient in order to protect him. Well, this is when he learns, uh, he, he comes to the realization that, you know, he just needs to tell the truth, and and uh, we get his great final speech in the bedroom. Right. The final speech right. in the bedroom, he comes up and he says, now you are you are my patient, we're not friends, I'm your doctor, and you've got to stick out your chin, because I'm going to hit you as hard as I'm gonna, I can. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to give you a wallop. And... <laughs> yes, I'm going to hit you in the face as hard as I can with a boot, uh, a <laughs> metaphorical boot. And uh, we'll just see how you do, and tells him the truth, and that's that's the that's the end of the film. As Reagan goes into this um, laughter, and everybody hugs, and all is well in the land. Right. Yep. How did that uh, last scene take you? That's when I wrote, "Hey, it's a triumph for mental health," and I don't think I was being uh, <laughs> I was being authentic when I wrote that. It's it felt very um, like saccharine Hollywood ending sort of thing, but at the same time. I was so relieved to have an, it end like that after all the darkness that it <laughs> I had for for two hours. I'm like, oh, and and to see uh, to see Drake's reaction to this, and actually to have, I, I it was a great character moment actually because having the truth be the element that actually is is what Drake needed to transform and actually let go of what had happened so that he can finally move forward to a place where he can get out of this room, he can he can become the businessman he was just, you know, and not look at the fact that he is uh, you know, this poor little guy who has no legs. And I actually really ended up liking that um that the transformation with him because of that speech. And so as saccharine as it was, it did work well for me. Yeah, I you know, I I, I agree with you from the standpoint that I just needed to have the plug pulled on this movie. <laughs> by the end, I was exhausted. I was exhausted by all of that, and and it just sort of moved through, got us to the happy part, and and it was uh, it, it ended up being a satisfying uh, ending, particularly as you know we we get this new character uh, introduced uh, living right. in 
in his house. This was uh, Anna uh, living in, in Paris's house uh, with her dad. Um, and uh, he just sort of falls in love with her rather quickly after he returns from Venice and she sort of leads him to tell the truth and then he runs back to her and that's that's the way the film ends. He runs across and hugs this new woman that we've only learned about for the last like 15 minutes, this 19-year-old. And uh, yeah, and that and, was that was one of the weakest parts. Of really the weak, film. really weak. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, it, it, I mean that all felt rather shoehorned in, and that was one of those ones where I was like, maybe in the book, you know, the the end is extended out a little longer. Yeah. There's more development of that relationship and of that character. As it was here, it did feel very shoehorned just to to get us um, through this it, part. Well, a give him the. Um, yeah, give him kind of that reconnection with his house and with kind of a, a, a somebody similar to Cassie, and then B to have kind of a voice of reason sitting on his shoulder, so right, to speak. Right. She has a lovely voice of reason. She did. She is she a lovely voice fine. of reason. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, we haven't uh, said a single thing about James Wong how so far in the film. I feel like we should do that before we wrap up. Oh, okay. Don't you Did think? you want to talk about anybody else? Did you? I, you know, I'm sorry. I, I, that was a, a signal change for you. Oh, I, I'm okay. sorry. Who else do you want to talk about? Well, I, you know, I just, Anne Sheridan, I thought was great. Um, she's been in a lot of films. Um, she was in They Drive by Night, a nice little uh, noirish film from, um, from 1940. And uh, she is also in The Treasure of the Sierra Madre, which we've talked about. She was yeah. uncredited as a pretty woman walking past the barbershop. <laughs> that's too funny. I think that's very funny. So, yeah, an, a woman with a great career. I really enjoyed her as Randy. I thought she did a great job in the filming. On the whole, I, I think I really enjoyed uh, most of the cast. I, I think some of them were given more to do than others. It really just depended on, on how much... Uh, the role was drawn out from the book. Um, Claude Rains, I really enjoyed as Dr. Tower. I thought he brought a nice darkness to it, uh, to that role, without having to even go into all of the incest and all that. There was enough darkness there that really gave me something to think about, about the relationship between him and his wife and his daughter. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Yes. He was a treat to see on screen. Always is, always is. And a very busy time for him because he yep. did uh, Now Voyager this year and Casablanca right afterward. Yes. Wow. Yeah. What a busy dude. Look at that. Very busy. Still only but, 77 credits. I, mean, it's a, well, I, I imagined him uh, being up in the uh, high hundreds. I think he's one of those guys who had just a very busy period. Yeah. You know, I mean, he was he was pretty much nonstop from the mid '30s to I don't know the the end of the '40s, beginning of the '50s, and right. then I think he he is a little more sporadic. Yeah. Uh, who else lights you up in this film? Anybody else um, specifically? No, I think that was it. I think that was it. All right. So now let's let's talk a little bit about our benefactor. Yes. How did this film stack up uh, uh, cinematographically to uh, our film last week? I really liked the look of this film. I, I read somewhere, uh, somebody described it as Midwestern Gothic cinematography, which I think fits it really nicely. I've also read comparisons to film noir. Um, it has a nice darkness to the tone of this town that I think was very fitting for this particular story, a, a, a story about a town that has a lot of dark elements. There were a lot of scenes where we'd go into houses and you had some fairly dramatic lighting. Dr. How Tower always had a very shadowy look with him. And I really enjoyed the way that he, uh, that uh, James Wong Howe played with that uh, throughout the film. I think the other area where that really, his, his work, his lighting work uh, is, is really on display is in the bedroom once Drake is amputated. I mean, the, the way the lighting, the tone of the lighting changes from the discovery of his amputation when he wakes up over the course of the next, you know, 30 minutes in the film, it becomes progressively more open and inviting um, from the periods where he's really struggling and he's turning his face to the can to the wall, uh, we have this really harsh kind of nightmare lighting to the very end when all three, uh, you know, when Paris comes back and they're talking about the great new plan that they have to 
to get out of the house and and go live in their new new place in their new housing development it's bright and open and inviting and it's it is a you know that room takes on a character of its own uh, which i think is important because the you know the drama of drake's character um, he is going through this period where all he wants is is to you know he he wants randy to promise him that he's he never has to leave that room he's embarrassed and he's he is shamed and he uh you know he he is feeling weak and the light i think really talks to this you know his strength coming back to him i thought that was a really powerful kind of sequence also the two women cassie and louise um as as they are both kind of going through their own types of madness um just the the lens choices there and just even having some diffusion um kind of really had uh, really added to this sense of these women who are in this world where they're powerless uh at, at this period of time really they're just powerless against um uh, any sort of man or you know these doctors who happen to be their fathers who are controlling them. Did you notice any of the deep focus tricks that we talked about last week? I did notice some deep focus. Um, I'm trying to remember where I think there was some, well, there's definitely some when he's like running through the, uh, the orchard around his house and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I know I did catch it in a couple other places, but I can't quite remember where I saw it. I, uh, yeah, I can't remember either. Yeah. Hoping you'd nailed that down, but I, I want to say there was, there was, yeah, there, there are <laughs> elements with the kids, I think, playing around in the beginning. Um, and that's another thing. I really enjoyed the cast of kids that they brought for all the younger versions of these people. I thought they were just fantastic kid actors. Right, right. Oh, I, I absolutely agree. And we, we only see them, well, we see them for, I, I guess, it's, gosh, the first 20 minutes of the film? Yeah, it was about. Um, yeah, we meet, and, you know, I think they did a great job transitioning the kids to, uh, to their grown up counterparts. I, you know, I, that was one thing that I thought, yeah, I, I can pick these kids out. Yeah, I uh, agree. To their, uh, to how they grew up. Um, uh, let's see what else from Dr. Howe. He's not, um, he's not a real doctor. I don't, yeah, I don't think he's a real doctor. Um, although he had plenty of other doctors to talk about in this film. But um, I don't know. I, I, I really liked the look. I thought he did a great job capturing this uh, this world in black and white that made it feel very realistic, but at the same time, a dark undertone. And it all worked really well for the uh, this story. Yeah, I, I really like the comparison to American Gothic. I mean, or the, the allusion to the American Gothic. This, you know, the way they capture the, uh, the trains... Uh, and the homes, uh, particularly in the doctor's offices, I think it's just really striking. Very, very dark, dark black point. Yes. Uh, really cool. Absolutely. Uh, anything else to talk about on this one? Well, the big other thing that I wanted to talk about is the music. Um, this is, this is uh, it's a pretty important score in the world of... Uh, film and some people uh, I I don't know if I agree but a lot of people say that this is one of the best film scores ever created um, Eric Wolfgang Korngold uh, wrote the score for this and it's it's a wonderful theme it's very memorable it works really well in context of the film um, the thing that it's most noted for however is the fact that um, John Williams really uh, was inspired by it. Although if you listen to the opening of Star Wars, he really just flat out ripped it off and used the actual theme from this and then just extended it, which I think was really interesting. You know, cause, you're right. We should post this Star Wars versus King's Row YouTube video. It's, it's pretty yeah. good. Yeah, it, I haven't seen the video, but I, I've heard both of the pieces and it's just funny how much John Williams, um, you know, quote was inspired by uh this music by eric Korngold, but it's uh it is beautiful music it is very memorable and i love it and it's just it's funny because as i watch this movie every time it comes up i just keep thinking about star wars <laughs> <laughs> oh the parallels don't end there i'll tell you luke and leia just weird <laughs> More incest. Weird. It just doesn't end. That's right. <laughs> trying to, you know, the father trying to kill his son. <laughs> yes. Right. And he gets his legs chopped off. <laughs> <laughs> he gets his legs chopped off, Andy. <laughs> uh. 
Oh, I think George Lucas watched this a few too many times. Fantastic. We just uncovered (laughs) something brilliant. Yes, we did. If you like Star Uh, Wars, you'll love King's (laughs) Row. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. I uh, I how did are we are we ready to move on to the details? Yes, let's move on. How did it do? How did it perform? This film, uh, it did well for itself. It didn't quite crack the top 10 for the year, but it was still a hit for 1942. It came out, unfortunately, um, like right after uh, right after the war and everything had kind of gone underway, and a lot of people felt that it was really bad timing for this film. Um, but it still was a hit for the year. It cost, from what I found, just over a million dollars, which is about $15.5 million today. And then it went on to domestically gross about five million dollars, which is about uh, seventy, almost seventy-three million dollars. So yeah, I'd say it did uh, it did pretty well for itself. It made about four hundred fifty thousand dollars per finished minute. Now, if I'm if I'm not correct, there was a sequel to the book, Paris and King's Row, or something. Uh, I believe it wasn't it something that his daughter. Yeah, uh, wrote? it was. It was written to, with him, at least credited with him and his daughter. Oh, uh, I okay. don't know anything about the story, but it, at 70, you know, adjusted dollars, 70 million adjusted dollars, I'm sort of surprised we didn't get a sequel uh, yeah, to right, King's right. Room. Man, that would be gloomy. So it was just a few years ago that Mildred Pierce was uh, remade as a, uh, I can't remember what it was, it was Showtime miniseries, something like that, um, maybe HBO, but this was a, a five-episode story that was able to tell a much fuller version of the story that was not able to be told at the time when the movie originally came out, which I believe was also back in the forties. So I can see, it, it I can seems... see David Fincher taking over King's row. That would be interesting. Yeah. I'm all for it. Awesome. Mm-hmm. I said we rank it. Let's do it. All right. Head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel. And you can play along just like Ben Lott. And you can watch this movie, and you can rank this movie, and let's see if we can uh, get another uh, another ranking that is just like Ben Lott's. Number five. Here we go. All right. <laughs> King's Row. <laughs> King's Row or The Road Warrior? The Road Warrior. Yes, The Road Warrior. I mean, I do really like King's Row, but we'll see how high it climbs. Uh, King's Row or Pete's Favorite? Taxi driver. <laughs> I, you know, I'm going to go King's Row. I am too, actually. Really? I know. I'm surprising myself, but I, I really did enjoy this film. King's Row or La Vie en Rose? I think I'll still do King's I, Row. I'll do King's Row too. King's Row or The Knight of the Hunter? The Knight of the Hunter. Huh. Yep. Knight of the Hunter for sure. King's Row or the Maltese Falcon? Hmm. Probably got to go with Bogey I'm, on this one. I'm going to go with Maltese Falcon. Yeah. King's Row or Driving Miss Daisy? Driving Miss Daisy. Talked about that one in a while. Yeah, I think I will pick Driving Miss Daisy as well. Uh, King's Row or Five Hundred Days of Summer? Hmm. Do I think I'm Five Hundred Days of Summer? That was pretty creative. Okay. You're good with that one? Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna, I'll let that go. King's Row or Syriana? Oh, jeez. I'm going to do Syriana. Wow. Where did I, what did I think of Syriana? Do you remember what I thought of Syriana? <laughs> well, I, you loved it, Pete. <laughs> I can't I remember that show. It wasn't even that long ago. I know it wasn't. I do I like, don't remember I do what like that Clooney. Yeah. Man, when Clooney. he gets his nails dug out there. Oh, ouch. Yeah. All right, I'm going to go with that. Two movies full of torture. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, I'm going to go with Syriana. All right, well, there we are. Number 118 out of 187. Yeah, that's probably about right. Yeah, I, it's it's a good place for that one to live. Yeah. I did enjoy that one quite a bit. I did, too. I, I enjoyed it enough. I enjoyed, I enjoyed the it experience enough, yeah. of, of watching it. I, th- I feel better having gotten this one under my belt. How about that? 
I am glad to have it in my list of films that I have seen because yes. I, I do think it's definitely one worth watching. I didn't I, until you. This was uh, your suggestion as we built the James Wong Howe list, and I, uh, I hadn't, I didn't even know that I needed to watch this film. I don't know if it was my suggestion. I think we looked at the highest ranked films uh, that he had done as a DP. And we picked from that. And I think that because it was a pretty blind pick because I knew nothing about it. I don't think I even knew this film. Oh, I yeah, mean, I knew it right. existed, but yeah, I don't. Uh, I think it was one of those, hey, this is ranked high. Let's watch that one. That's I, We've got a couple of those coming up. I think. What is it? Where do we go from here? Um, we're going to be jumping a little bit farther forward. And we're going to be talking about the fantastic film, Sweet Smell of Success. Oh, yeah. 1957. Uh, this is good. This is a uh, little uh, Tony Curtis. Burt yep. Lancaster. Yeah, yeah. Like Alexander those McKendrick. This is this is a uh, dark film. Yeah. Oh, I can't wait to see this one. This is good. Um, so that's next week. Um, until then, I'm going to go to bed. All right. I've got someone's uh, legs in the other room. I've got to go amputate. George Bratton says of the King's Row DVD, the only good thing about King's Row is the incredibly beautiful score composed by Eric Wolfgang Korngold. The movie itself is stiff, poorly acted, badly written, and features cheap sets with fake-looking backdrops. The whole thing looks cheap. Maybe, maybe money for making movies was scarce in 1942. Big disappointment after hearing about this film for many years. It was, however, interesting to see Ronald Reagan as a young man long before he met Nancy and wound up in the White House. By the score... Forget the movie. Ouch. Yeah. You know, what are you going to do? Uh, and, and, you know, uh, there's even a, a comment after that one from T-Rock, who says, after reading King's Row, I was curious about the movie. The review is correct without the political jab. <laughs> one more thing, he says, the casting is horrible. Forget the movie by the book. So wow. first by the score and then forget the movie. And once you've forgotten the movie, buy the book and hope that that doesn't remind you once again of the movie or, or the score. <sighs> Whatever. Uh, a, or the actors. Or, or the, the actors and the cast. <laughs> <laughs> Too funny. What's yours? Well, I've got a two-star by Audrey D. Anderson, who says, The Greatest Generation Speaks. I am a member of the greatest generation, and I abhor the language the indecency and anti-American and anti-Christian attitude of what is going on in this great nation. I refuse to listen or watch all the hideous stuff going on under the title, quote, entertainment. I am, however, very happy to be able to select decent films and books from you. Audrey D. Anderson. Wait, that's, <laughs> that's the end? That's the end. The best part of hers is, uh, <laughs> is the comments. And exactly how do your comments constitute a review? <laughs> <laughs> the other one, and what the hell does any of this nonsense have to do with King's Row? <laughs> it's a place to review films, music, books, etc. Not to give your view of the nation. <laughs> not to Audrey D. Anderson. Uh, yes, I have a feeling she might be from Fulton. Oh! <laughs> Man. Amazon. Andy, it is hard to believe that we have been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. You are telling me. Producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. I love The Next Reel Season 4. Do you know why? I don't. Why? Because we got to talk about my favorite movie, Terry Gilliam's Brazil. That's not even an adaptation. Uh, no, but it was such a great part of our, of our great Terry Gilliam series. And a few others in that series were adaptations, like The Adventures of Baron Munchausen, adapted from Raspi's stories, and 
La Jete, which inspired 12 Monkeys. Oh, right. And, and for our Man With No Name trilogy, we saw how Sergio Leone's A Fistful of Dollars was basically stolen from Kurosawa's Yojimbo. We added Labor Day to our Jason Reitman series, adapted from Joyce Maynard's novel. Oof, there's one we'll always regret. Our big Stephen King series covered adaptations like The Shining, Cujo, Christine, and Stand By Me, great horror, and coming-of-age tales. Another Coen Brothers adaptation, too. We got to talk about how they turned Homer's The Odyssey into Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? For our holiday series, we did The Bishop's Wife and The Poseidon Adventure. And who could forget seeing Alec Guinness in the adaptation of Kind Hearts and Coronets during our series dedicated to him? We really need to do more of his films. Truly. We had our first film noir series with classics like Double Indemnity, Detour, and Out of the Past. And our black and white cinematography of James Wong Howe series with The Thin Man, Sweet Smell of Success, Seconds, and King's Row. So many adaptations. Oh, you're not kidding. Dive deeper into these originals and more at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every book you buy helps support our show. Get the full list at thenextreel.com slash originals and start reading today. 